Chapter One of Poppy's Presents. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Esther Ben Simonides. Poppy's Presents by Mrs. O. F. Walton. Chapter One: The Little Red Cloak. The great cathedral bell was striking twelve. Slowly and solemnly it struck, and as it did so, people looked at their watches and altered their clocks for every one in the great city kept time by that grave old bell. Every one liked to hear it strike, but the school children liked it best of all, for they knew that with the last stroke of twelve lessons would be over, and they would be able to run home to dinner. "'Good morning, children,' said Miss Benson, the mistress. "'Good morning, ma'am,' said the girls, and then they marched out like soldiers in single file. So quiet they were, so grave, so orderly they went, almost as solemnly as the old bell itself. But only till they reached the school door. Then they broke up into a merry, noisy crowd, running and shouting, chasing each other from side to side, jumping, hopping, and skipping as they went down the street. "'Oh, dear, what a noise them children do make,' said old Mrs. North, as she got up and shut her cottage door. But the noise soon died away, for the children were hungry, and they were hurrying home to dinner. "'What is that little bit of red we see in front of the crowd? It is a little girl in a scarlet cloak, and she is turning down a long, straight road, which leads into the heart of the city. Let us follow her and see where she is going.' She is very tidily dressed. There is a clean white holland pinafore under the scarlet cloak, and although her shoes are old, they are well patched and mended. But she is turning into a very poor part of the city. The streets are getting narrower and more crowded, and they are getting darker, too, for the quaint, old-fashioned houses overhang the pavement, and so nearly meet overhead that very little light or air can get into the dismal street below. Still on and on goes the little red cloak, and now she is turning down a court on the left-hand side of the street. An open court it ought to be, with a row of houses on each side and an open space in the middle. But it is not an open space to-day, for it is everybody's washing day in Greyfriars Court, and long lines are stretched from side to side, and shirts and petticoats and stockings and all manner of garments are waving in the breeze. The little red cloak threads her way underneath. Sometimes the corner of a wet towel hits her in the face. Sometimes she has to bend almost double to get underneath a dripping blanket or sheet but she makes her way through them all and passes on to the last house in that long, digy court, and as she does so, she notices a little crowd of women standing by her mother's door. There's old Mrs. Smith leaning off on her crushes, and Sarah Ann Spavin and her mother, and Mrs. Lee with her baby in her arms, and Mrs. Holliday with Tommy and Freddie and Ann Eliza. And as she looks up, she sees several faces looking out of the windows of her head. What could be the matter? Had anything happened to her mother? Was her mother dead? That was her first thought, poor child. But nobody was looking particularly grave, and they laughed as they caught sight of the little red cloak coming under the white sheets and tablecloths. "'Why, well, here's Poppy,' said Mrs. Holliday, as she came up to them. "'Well, Poppy,' cried another, "'have you heard the news?' "'Your mother's got a present for you, Poppy,' said Sarah Ann Spavin. "'You'd better hurry in and have a look at it.' "'A present for me?' said the child. "'What is it?' But the women only laughed and bade her go and see. And the faces at the window overhead laughed, too, and said there was such a thing as having too much of a good thing. Poppy passed them all and went in, and she heard her mother's voice calling to her to come upstairs. Her mother was in bed, and she beckoned Poppy to come up to her. "'Poppy, child,' she said rather sorrowfully, "'I've got a present for you.' Just what the neighbors had told her, and the child wondered more and more what this present could be. It was a very long time now since Poppy had had a present. She had never had one since her father went away, and it was six months since he had left them. Poppy often wondered where he had gone. Her mother never talked about him now, and the neighbors sometimes shook their heads when he was mentioned, and said he was a bad man. But he had often brought Poppy a present on a Saturday night when he got his wages. Sometimes he brought her a packet of sweets, sometimes an apple, and once a beautiful box of doll's tea things. But since he went away there had been no presents for Poppy. Her mother had had to work very hard to get enough money to pay the rent and to get bread for them to eat. There was no money to spare for anything else. What could this present be, about which all the neighbors knew? Look here, Poppy, said her mother, and she pointed to a little bundle of flannel, lying on one side of the bed. Poppy went round and peeped into it, and there she saw her present, a tiny baby with a very red face, and a quantity of black hair, and with its little fists holding in small fat cheeks. Oh, what a beauty, said Poppy, in an awestruck voice. Is it for me, mother? Yes, said the mother with a sigh, it's for you, Poppy. But that isn't all, said old Mrs. Trendle, who was standing at the foot of the bed. That's only half your present, Poppy. Look here. And in her arms Poppy saw another bundle, and when she had opened it, lo and behold, 
what should there be but another little baby also with a very red face and plenty of black hair and with his little fists holding its fat cheeks two of them said poppy in amazement are you sure they are both for us mother yes they are both for us said the poor woman both for us poppy who sent them asked the child god sent them poor little things said her mother looking sorrowfully at the two little bundles are they god's presents to me asked poppy yes to you and to me poppy said her mother there's nobody else to look after them ah you'll have your work set now poppy said old mrs trundle but poppy did not think of the work just then two dear little babies and for her own she was very very happy she could scarcely eat any dinner although mrs lee took her across the court into her house that she might get some with her children and it was a great trial to her when her mother told her she must go back to school as usual you'll get little enough schooling now go while you may poppy she said the excitement in the court was not over when the child passed down it on her way to school the neighbors came to the doors when they caught sight of her red cloak and some of them said poor poppy and some of them shook their heads mournfully without saying anything the child could not understand why they all pitied her so much she thought they ought to be glad that such a nice present had come for her on her way to school poppy passed under a curious old gateway which had been built many hundred years ago and which still stood in the old wall of the city under the shadow of this ancient bar was a shop such a pretty shop poppy thought it and it was very seldom that she went under the gateway without stopping to look in at the window for there sitting in a row and looking out at her were a number of dolls beautiful wax dolls with curly hair and blue eyes and pink cheeks and poppy had never had a wax doll of her own her only doll was an old wooden creature with no real hair and with long straight arms she could never even sit down for her back and her legs would not bend and when poppy came home and looked at her after she had been gazing in the toy shop window she thought her very ugly indeed one day when poppy was standing under the bar a lady and a little girl came up to the shop the little girl was just as tall as poppy and she stood beside her gazing at the row of dolls i should like that one mother she said the one with the yellow hair and a red necklace that was poppy's favorite too she would have chosen that one she said to herself the lady had gone into the shop and bought the doll and poppy watched the happy little girl walk away with it in her arms and then poor poppy went into a dark corner under the bar and cried a little to herself before she went on to school if only her mother had enough money to buy her a wax doll but on the day poppy's presents came she did not even stop for a moment to look at the wax dolls what stupid creatures they seemed to her now her babies could open and shut their eyes and none of these dolls could do that her babies could move and yawn and cry and kick they were far better than dolls and mother had said god had sent them he must have known how much she had wanted one of those wax dolls poppy thought end of chapter one Chapter Two of Poppy's Presence by Mrs. O. F. Walton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Two, Poppy's Work. Poppy's work soon began in good earnest. Her mother had to go out to work, and while she was away, there was no one but Poppy to take care of the babies. She liked to work very much at first. Their eyes were as blue as those of the wax dolls in the shop window, and their hair was quite as pretty. But as the days went by, Poppy could not help wishing that her babies would sometimes be as quiet as the row of dolls in the shop under the bar. Poppy's babies were never quiet except when they were asleep, and unfortunately, it was very seldom that they were both asleep at the same time. Poor little Poppy, her small arms ached very often as she carried those restless babies, and sometimes she felt so tired that she thought she must let them fall. Oh, how they cried! Sometimes they went on hour after hour without stopping, and then at length one baby would fall asleep quite tired out. But no sooner did its weary little cry cease than the other one would scream more loudly than before and would wake it up again. There was no end to Poppy's work. She was warming milk and filling bottles. She was pacing up and down the room. She was singing all the hymns she had learned at school to soothe them to sleep. She was nursing and patting and rocking her babies from morning till night. Brave little Poppy! The tears would come in her eyes sometimes when the babies were more cross than usual, and she would think how nice it would be to feel rested sometimes. She was always so tired now, but she never gave up her work. She would not have left her babies for the world. She loved them through it all. Even when her mother came home in the evening, Poppy's work was not finished. Poor tired mother, she came slowly and wearily up the court and then sank down upon a chair just inside the door, almost too exhausted to speak. Give me the babies, Poppy, darling, she would say. But Poppy knew that her mother had been standing all the day at the wash tub, and she was almost too tired to speak, and so she would say, Oh, I'll keep them a bit, mother. Get a cup of tea first. And so the evening wore away, and bedtime came. 
the time when most little girls of poppy's age get into soft cosy beds and sleep peacefully till the sunbeams wake them gently in the morning but even at night poppy's work was not over one or other little babies was crying nearly all the night and sometimes both were crying together poppy used to see her poor mother pacing up and down backwards and forwards on the bedroom floor trying to hush one of the fretful children to sleep and then she would creep out of bed and say give it to me mother you are so tired and so cold and then poppy would take her turn in that constant tramp tramp across the floor and at last when the happy moment came if it ever did come in which both babies were worn out with crying and were laid asleep beside her mother poppy would creep cold and shivering into bed and the night would seem all too short for her yet in spite of all the work the babies gave her poppy was very proud of her presence and when her mother got out two white frocks which poppy had worn when she was a baby and dressed the poor little twins in them one sunday afternoon poppy danced for joy don't they look lovely mother she said you must pray for them poppy when we get to church said her mother we are going to give them to god what will he do with them mother said poppy he won't take them away will he no said her mother he won't take them away just yet but i want them to belong to him as long as they live and then he'll take them home by and by poppy was very attentive at church that day how pretty her babies looked as the clergyman took them in his arms her mother had been very anxious that they should have bible names and after much searching and after many long talks with poppy on the subject she had fixed on enoch and elijah as the names for the little brothers poppy was very happy that sunday as she walked home with little enoch in her arms but when they got into the house her mother sat down and burst into tears what is it mother dear said the child are you tired no my dear it isn't that she said i'll tell you some time when the babies are asleep they were asleep much sooner than usual that night the fresh air had made them sleepy and poppy and her mother had a quiet evening tell me why you were crying mother dear when we came home from church oh poppy said her mother i don't know how to tell you my poor little lassie what is it mother do tell me you know you said god had sent a present for you poppy when the babies came yes for me and you mother said the child poppy said her mother i think he's going to give you the biggest share of it i think i'm going to die poppy and leave you all oh poppy 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 and she sobbed as if her heart would break poppy felt as if she were dreaming and could not understand what her mother was saying mrs byers in the house opposite had died a little time before but she had been ill in bed for many a month and mrs jack's little boy and girl had died but then they had a fever her mother could walk about and could go out to work and could look after the babies how could she be going to die i didn't like to tell you poppy her mother went on but it is true my darling and it's better you should know before it comes but mother you are not ill are you said the child and as she said this she looked at her mother yes she certainly did look very thin and pale and tired as she sat by the fire i'm feeling fast poppy said her mother wasting away i felt it coming on me a long time dear before your father went away and last week i got a ticket for the dispensary and the doctor said he couldn't do nothing for me it was too late he said if it wasn't for you and the babies poppy i would be glad to go for i'm very very tired mother said poppy with a great sob however will we get along without you i don't know said the poor woman i don't know poppy but the good lord knows and he is a good lord child he's never failed me yet and i know he'll help you i know he will come to me my darling and the mother took her little girl in her arms and held her to her bosom and they had a good cry together but before very long the twins awoke and poppy and her mother began their work again end of chapter two Chapter Three of Poppy's Presents by Mrs. O. F. Walton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Esther Ben Simonides. Chapter Three, A Holiday. The next morning, when Poppy woke, she felt as if she had had a bad dream. Her mother's words the night before came back to her mind. I think I am going to die and leave you all. It could not be true, surely. She raised herself in bed and looked round. Her mother was up already. She could hear her moving about downstairs, and she had lighted the fire. For Poppy could hear the sticks crackling in the grate. The twins were still asleep, lying in bed beside her, and the child peeped at their little peaceful faces and stooped to kiss Elijah's tiny hand, which was lying on the coverlet of the bed. They knew nothing about it, poor little things. It could not be true, Poppy said to herself. Her mother could not be going to die. She must have dreamt it all. She crept out of bed very quietly so as not to wake the babies, dressed herself, and went downstairs to help her mother get breakfast ready. But she found everything done when she got into the kitchen. The cloth was on the table and a cup for Poppy, and another for her mother, and two slices of bread and two cups of tea. "'Oh, mother,' said Poppy, "'I didn't know I was so late.' "'You're going to have a holiday today, Poppy,' said her mother. "'Do you know it's your birthday?' "'My birthday, mother,' repeated the child. 
"'Yes, you're nine years old today, my poor little lass,' said her mother. "'I reckon that up as I was walking about with the babies last night, and I mean you to have a rest today. You've been a toiling and a moaning with the babies ever since they was born. It's time you had a bit of quiet and peace.' "'But you're poorly, mother,' said the child. "'No worse than usual,' said her mother, "'and I've got no work today. Mrs. Peterson isn't going to wash till tomorrow, so you're to have a real quiet day, Poppy.' But Poppy, like a good child, could not sit idle when she saw her mother working, and so in the afternoon, as soon as dinner was over, her mother sent her out for a walk and told her not to come home till tea-time. "'There's Jack and Sally. They've got holidays, Poppy. Get them to go with you,' she said. Jack and Sally lived in a house on the opposite side of the court. They went to the same school to which Poppy had gone before the babies came, and they had always played together since they were tiny children. So Poppy put on her scarlet cloak, and the three children started in fine spirits. It was such a bright sunny day, and everything looked cheerful and happy. There had been a hard frost the night before, and the road was firm and dry under their feet, and the three children ran along merrily. They went a long way outside the walls till they came to a river, by the side of which was a small footpath following the river in all its windings, and leading across grassy fields, which in summer time were filled with wild flowers, and which were now covered with pure white snow. Oh, how much Poppy enjoyed that walk! She had been so long shut up in that tiny house, she had been so long imprisoned like a wild bird in a small cage, that now, when she found herself free to run where she liked in the clear, frosty air, she felt full of life and spirits. She had forgotten for a time the sorrow of the night before. All was so bright and beautiful around her, there was nothing to remind her of sickness or of death. She was very happy and skipped along like a little wild goat. They walked more slowly when they got into the city again, for they were tired with their long walk, and as they passed the great cathedral, Jack proposed they should go inside, and rest for a little time on the chairs in the nave. "'There's lots of time yet, Poppy,' he said. "'It isn't tea time, I'm sure.' It was getting dark for all that, and the lamps were lighted in the cathedral. Jack took off his hat as he pushed open the heavy oaken door, and the little girls followed him. Service was going on in the choir, and they could hear the solemn tones of the organ pealing through the building, and with them came the sweet sound of many voices singing. "'Isn't it beautiful?' said Poppy. "'Let us sit down and listen.' They were very quiet until the service was over, and when the last amen was sung and the doors of the choir were thrown open for the people to leave, they got up to go home. But as they were walking across the cathedral to the door which stood nearest the direction of their home, Jack suddenly stopped. "'Hello, Poppy,' he whispered. "'Look here!' And he pointed to a little door in the wall which stood ajar. "'What is it, Jack?' said both little girls at once. "'Where does it go to? Is it a tomb?' "'Oh, no,' said Jack. "'It's the way folks go up to the top of the tower. "'You know we often see them walking about on the top.' My father went up last Easter Monday. I always thought they kept it locked. Let's go a bit of the way up and see what it's like. Oh, no, Jack, said Sally. It looks so dark in there. Don't be a silly baby, Sally, he said. Poppy isn't afraid, are you, Poppy? No, said Poppy in a trembling voice. No, I'm not frightened, Jack. Come in then quick, said the boy. I'll go first and you can follow me. But isn't it tea time, said Poppy? Jack did not stop to answer her. He led the way up the steep, winding stone steps, and the two little girls followed. "'Jack, Jack, stop a minute,' said Poppy, when they had wound round and round three or four times. "'I don't think we ought to go.' "'I believe you're frightened now, Poppy,' he said. "'I thought you'd more pluck than that. "'We won't go far. I just want to get to that place on the roof, where we see the people stand when they're going up. "'It's only about halfway to the top. Come on, we shall soon be there.' It took a longer time than Jack expected, however, for the steps were very steep, winding round and round like a corkscrew and the children were getting tired, and could not climb quickly. They stood for a few moments on the roof outside and looked down into the city, but they could not see much, for it was getting very dark, and even Jack was willing to own that it was time to go home. It did not take them quite so long to go down the steps as it had taken them to go up, but they were slippery and much worn in places, and the little girls felt very much afraid of falling, and were very glad when Jack, who was going first, said they were near the bottom. But Poppy and Sally a moment afterwards were very much startled, for Jack gave a sudden cry of horror as he reached the bottom step. The little door through which they had come was closed. Jack shook it and hammered it with his fists, but he could not open it. It was locked, and they were prisoners in the tower. The verger, who had the charge of the door, had remembered that he had left it unfastened, and had turned the key in the lock soon after the children had entered the tower. No one had been near when they had crept inside, and so the verger had no idea that anyone had gone up the steps. "'Oh, Jack, 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 what shall we do?' said Poppy. End of chapter 3「4 of Poppy's Presence by Mrs. O. F. Walton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Esther Benzaminides. Chapter 4. A Long Night. 
"'Yes, they were locked in, there was no doubt about it. "'But don't cry, Poppy,' said Jack as she burst in tears. "'We'll soon make them here. The verger sits on that bench close by.' "'Jack hammered with his fists on the door, and the sound echoed through the hollow building. "'Then the three children waited and listened, hoping to hear the verger's footsteps approaching the door. "'And when some moments had passed and no one came, he knocked again, and once more they waited and listened.' but it was all in vain. No one heard the rapping on the door. No one came to let the little prisoners out. "'He must have gone into the crypt,' said Sally. "'He goes down there when folks come to see the cathedral. Maybe he'll be back soon.' But Jack did not answer her. He was on his knees on the ground, peeping under the crack of the door. "'What can you see, Jack?' asked Poppy. "'It's all dark,' said Jack. "'The cathedral lights are out, and everybody's gone home. Whatever shall we do?' The two little girls sat down on the bottom step and cried and sobbed as if their hearts would break. "'What's the use of crying?' said Jack, rather angrily. "'What we've got to do is to try to get out. "'Let's climb up again and get on the roof. "'Maybe we can make someone here if we shout loud enough.' "'It's so dark up there now,' said Sally, "'glancing fearfully at the narrow winding staircase. "'We can't see our way a bit.' "'Never mind that. We can feel,' said the boy. "'Come along.' "'Oh, I shall fall, I shall fall,' sobbed Sally. "'You stop down here, then,' said her brother. "'Poppy and I will go.' "'Oh, no, no, no!' cried the frightened child. "'Don't leave me. I don't want to stop here by myself.' Very slowly and carefully the three children felt their way up the steep steps, and many a tear fell on the old stones as the girl followed Jack. It seemed a long, long way to them, far farther than it had done before, and the wind which had been rising all the afternoon came howling and whistling through the narrow window slits in the tower, and made them cold and shivering. At last they reached the open place on the roof, but they found it was impossible to stand upon it. Such a hurricane of wind had arisen that they would have been blown over had they tried to leave the shelter of the tower. So all they could do was to remain where they were, and to shout as loudly as they could for help. But the cathedral close was very large, and no one passed through it on that cold, stormy evening, and the street was far away, so far that the voices of the children could not be heard by the passers-by, but were drowned by the noisy, blustering wind. They shouted until they were hoarse, but no help came, and at last even Jack was obliged to acknowledge that he was afraid there was no help for it, but they must make up their minds to stay there for the night. "'Oh, dear, whatever will Mother do without me?' said Poppy. "'She'll have nobody to help her. I must get back to my babies. "'Oh, Jack, Jack, I must get back to my babies.' "'But you can't get back, Poppy,' said Jack mournfully. "'There's nothing for it but waiting till morning.' "'I'm so cold,' sobbed Sally, "'and I want my tea. Whatever shall we do without our tea?' "'It can't be helped,' said Jack, "'and it's no good crying. Let's go to the bottom of the tower again. "'It's not so windy there as it is up here.' It was hard work getting down in the dark, and with the whistling wind rushing in upon them at every turn, the old stone steps were worn away in many places, for thousands of feet had trodden them since the day they were put in their places, and the children sometimes lost their footing and would have fallen had they not held so tightly to each other. When they reached the bottom of the stone staircase, they crouched together close to the door, in the most sheltered corner they could find, and tried to keep each other warm. But it was a bitterly cold night, and the rough, noisy wind came tearing and howling down the staircase, and found them out in their hiding place, and made them shiver from head to foot. And as the hours went by, they felt more and more hungry. Their long walk had given them a good appetite, and they had had a very early dinner. Poor little Sally cried incessantly, and the others did all they could to cheer her. But she refused to be comforted, and at last she was so tired and exhausted that she sobbed herself to sleep. Jack soon afterwards followed her example and fell asleep beside her, and only poor Poppy was awake, crying quietly to herself, and thinking of her mother, and of Enoch and Elijah. She was too anxious and too much troubled to sleep, and the hours seemed very long to her. It was such a lonely place in which to spend the night. There was no sound to be heard but the howling of the wind and the striking of the great cathedral clock, which made Poppy jump every time it struck the hour. How long it seemed to Poppy from one hour to another. The time went much more slowly than usual that night, she thought. Once she became so very lonely and frightened that she felt as if she must wake the others. But she was an unselfish little girl, and she remembered how much poor Sally had cried, and felt glad that she and Jack could forget their trouble for a little time. So she crept quietly away without disturbing them, and climbed slowly up the steep steps to the place where she remembered the first window slit in the tower came. She thought she would feel less lonely if she could see the lamps burning in the streets, and would feel that the world was not quite so far away as it had seemed to her during all those long, quiet hours. Poppy did not like to go so far from the children, and once or twice she turned back, but at length she climbed as far as the slit and looked out. There were the lamps on either side of the long street which led to the cathedral, but they seemed a great way off, and the cathedral close was quite dark and empty. "'There isn't anybody near,' said Poppy to herself, as she looked down. And then she looked up, up into the sky. It was covered with clouds which the wind was driving wildly along, but as Poppy looked there came a break in the clouds, and one little patch of sky was left clear and uncovered. 
and there shining down upon poppy was a star such a bright beautiful star it made her think of heaven and of the god who made the stars god is near said poppy to herself mother says he is always close beside us oh dear i quite forgot i have never said my prayers to-night the child knelt down at once on the cold stone steps and prayed and her little prayer went up higher than the tower of the great cathedral to the ears of the lord who loves little children to speak to him oh god prayed poppy please take care of me and jack and sally and please don't let mother be frightened and please make the babies go to sleep for jesus christ's sake amen poppy felt comforted after she had prayed she crept down the steps again and wrapping her little red cloak as tightly round her as she could she lay down beside sally and fell asleep end of chapter four chapter five of poppy's presence by mrs o f walton this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Esther Ben Simonides. Chapter Five. Found at last. That was a terrible night, and one which would never be forgotten in Greyfriars Court. Hardly any of the people of the court went to bed, for they were all helping in the search for the lost children. The bellman was sent up and down the city till late that night that he might try to hear tidings of them. The policemen were making inquiries in all directions. The neighbors were scouring the city from one end to the other. Jack and Sally's father and mother were walking about the whole night, looking for the children in all places, likely and unlikely. And Poppy's poor mother, who could not leave the babies, paced up and down her room and looked anxiously from her window, and trembled each time that footsteps came down the court. She could do nothing herself to help her little girl, but she had a strong friend who could help her. Again and again through that long anxious night, Poppy's mother asked the Lord to watch over her child and to bring her safe home again. Only one trace of the children had been found when morning dawned. Sally had dropped her little handkerchief on the path leading to the river. This handkerchief had been found by a policeman, and it had been shown to Sally's mother, and she had said, with tears in her eyes, that it belonged to her little girl. Could the children be drowned in the river? This was the terrible fear which the neighbors whispered to each other, as they met together after the night's search, but no one mentioned it to Poppy's mother. "'I wouldn't tell her about that there handkerchief, poor thing,' said one to another. "'Maybe they're not in the river after all.' In the morning, as soon as it was light, search was to be made in the water for the bodies, and everyone in Greyfriars Court watched anxiously for the result. Very early in the morning the cathedral door was unlocked, and one of the vergers, an old man of the name of Standish, entered with his wife, old Betty Standish, and with his daughter Roseanne to make the cathedral fires, and to put all in readiness for the services of the day. As the two women raked out the cinders and ashes from the stoves, the sound echoed through the hollow building and woke the sleeping children in the tower. Jack sprang to his feet at once as he saw the dim gray light stealing down the staircase, and as he heard the voices in the cathedral. "'It's morning at last,' he said. "'Now we shall get out.' And he hammered with all his might on the door. But the women were making so much noise themselves that the sound did not attract their attention. They went on with their fire lighting and took no notice. Then the children began to call out, "'Let us out! Let us out, please! We're locked in!' The two women paused in their work and listened. Again the shout came, "'Let us out! Let us out! We can't get out! Open the door, please!' "'Whatever on earth is it?' asked Rose Dan, coming up to her mother with an awestruck face. "'Ay, my dear, I don't know,' said her mother, who was trembling from head to foot. "'I never heard the like. I never did. Call your father, Roseanne.' The verger was in the choir, putting the books in order, and making all ready for the service. He came at once when his daughter called him. "'Listen, Joshua, listen,' said old Betty. And once more the children called, "'Let us out, please! We're locked in! Let us out!' "'Do you think it's a ghost, Joshua?' said his wife, looking fearfully at the old tombs, by which she was surrounded on all sides. "'Ghost! Rubbish!' said her husband, but he was as white as a sheet, and almost as frightened as she was. "'Let's go and tell the dean,' said Roseanne. "'Nonsense!' said the verger, who had recovered himself a little. "'Let's listen where the sound comes from.' "'Let us out! Unlock the door, please!' shouted the children again. "'It's someone in the tower,' said the old man. "'Though how on earth anyone could have got there, it passes me to think.' So the old people and their daughter went in the direction of the cries, and the verger took the great old key from his pocket, which unlocked the tower door. Yet even when the key was in the keyhole, he paused a moment, as if he did not like to turn in the lock. "'I wonder whoever it can be,' so he said timidly. "'It's a ghost. I'll be bound it's a ghost,' said old Betty. "'They say they do hunt all these queer old places.' "'Well, we'll have a look,' said her husband, summoning up all his courage. "'So here goes.' He turned the key, the door flew open, and out came the three poor children, weary, pale, and shivering with cold. "'Well, I never,' said the verger's wife, holding up her hands in amazement. "'Wherever on earth have you come from?' said her husband. "'I know, father,' said Roseanne. "'These must be the three children of Greyfriars Court. "'I heard the bellman crying them last night.' "'Poor little cold thing,' said old Betty. "'And have you been locked in the tower all night?' "'Yes, ma'am,' said Poppy. "'All night.' "'But however did you get there?' said the verger. "'That's what I want to know.' 
"'Please, sir, don't be angry,' said Jack. "'We found the door open, and we went in.' "'Well, I never heard the like,' said Rosanne. "'I declare they're shaking from head to foot. "'Such a night as it has been, too. Oh, "'It'll be a wonder if it isn't the death of them.' "'Come along, my poor Bain,' said the old woman. "'I've got some hot coffee on the hall but home. "'You shall have a drink at once.' "'Oh, no, thank you,' said Poppy. "'I must come to mother.' "'So you shall, my dear, so you shall,' said old Betty. "'But to go all the quicker for getting a bit of warmth into you. "'Why, oh, you're stiff with cold, I declare. "'Poor old lambs, you must have had a night of it. "'Bring them across, Rosanne.' "'And the kind old woman trotted on in front of her "'to stir her fire into a blaze, "'and to pour out the hot coffee for the poor children.' She made them sit with their feet on the fender whilst they were drinking it, and she gave them each a piece of a hot cake which she brought out of the oven. And all the time they were eating it, she and Rosanne were crying over them by turns, and the old verger was shaking his head and saying, I never heard the like. It's a strange business altogether, it is. As soon as they were warmed and fed, the verger and his wife and Rosanne took the children home, and I wish you could have seen their arrival in Greyfriars Court. There was such a kissing and hugging and crying, such an excitement and stir, such a rejoicing over the children who had been lost but were found again, and such a thanksgiving in the heart of Poppy's mother as she saw the answer to her prayer. No one could make too much of the three children that day. They were invited out to tea to every house in the court, and sweets and cakes and pennies were showered upon them, till the two mothers declared they would be quite spoilt, until Jack announced he would not much mind spending another night in the tower if they got all these good things when they came home. But Poppy and Sally shook their hands at this, and would not agree with him. End of chapter 5《ハッピー・オブ・ポピー・プレゼンス》by Mrs. O. F. Walton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Esther Ben Simonides. Chapter 6 Poppy Writes a Letter. Poppy, I want you to write a letter for me, darling, said her mother one day. Is it to my father? asked the child. No, Poppy, it isn't to your father. Why do you never write to my father, mother? asked Poppy. Her mother did not answer her at once, and Poppy did not like to ask her again. But after a few minutes, her mother got up suddenly and shut the door. "'Poppy, I'll tell you,' she said, "'for I'm going to leave you and you ought to know.' And then instead of telling her, the poor woman burst into tears. "'Don't cry, mother, don't cry,' said the child. "'Don't tell me if you'd rather not.' "'But I must tell you, Poppy,' she said, as she dried her eyes and looked into the fire. "'Poppy, I loved your father more than I can tell you, and he loved me, child. "'Yes, he did love me. Never you believe anyone who tells you he didn't love me. "'He loved me, and he loved you, Poppy. "'He was very good to you, wasn't he, my child?' "'Yes, mother, very good,' said Poppy, as she remembered how kind he always was to her when he came in from work. "'But he got into bad company, Poppy, and he took to drinking. "'I wouldn't tell you, dear, only I'm going away, and so I think you ought to know. "'Well, bit by bit he was led away. "'Sometimes, dear, I blame myself, and thinks, perhaps, I might have done more to keep him at home. "'But he was always so pleasant with all his mates, and they made so much of him. "'And they let him on. Yes, Poppy, they let him on. They did indeed. "'And I saw him getting further and further wrong, and I could not stop him.' "'and there are things which I didn't know about, dear. "'Horse racing and card playing and all that sort of thing. "'And one day, Poppy,' said her mother, lowering her voice, "'I wouldn't tell you, my dear, if I wasn't going away. "'One day he went out to his work as usual, "'and he made him a cup of hot coffee to drink before he started. "'I always made him that, dear, if he was off ever so early. "'Well, he was ready to go, and he turned out at the door, and says he, "'Is Poppy awake? "'No, the barn was fast asleep when I came down,' says I. "'He put down his breakfast tin by the door, and he crept upstairs.' "'and I could hear in his steps in the room overhead. "'And then, Poppy, I listened at the foot of the stairs, "'and I heard him give you a kiss. "'I didn't say anything, child, when he came down, "'for I thought maybe he wouldn't like me to notice it, "'and he hurried out, as if he was afraid I should ask him what he was doing. "'Well, dear, dinner time came, and I always had it ready and waiting for him, "'for I think it's a sin and a shame, Poppy, "'when them that works for the meat never has time to give them to eat it. "'But the dinner waited long enough that day, child, for he never came home.' I began to think something must be wrong, for you always came home of the dinner hour. I thought maybe he had had some drink, but Poppy was far worse than that, for, oh, my darling, he never came home no more. What was wrong with him, mother? He was in debt, child, and had lost money in them horrid races, and there were more things than that, but I can't tell you all, my dear, nor I don't want to tell. Only this I want to say. If he ever comes back, Poppy, tell him I loved him to the last, and I prayed for him to the last, and I shall look to meet him in heaven. "'Mind you tell him that, Poppy, my dear.' "'Yes, mother,' said the child with tears in her eyes. "'I won't forget.' "'And now about the letter. "'I wish I could write to your father, Poppy, "'but I've never had a word from him all this cruel long time. "'Not a single world, child. "'And where he is at this moment, I know no more than that table does.' "'Then who has the letter to be written to, mother?' asked the child. "'It's to your granny, Poppy, I want to write. "'His mother, your father's mother. "'I never saw her, child, but she's a good old woman, I believe. "'He always talked a deal about his mother.' And many a time I've thought I ought to write and tell her, 
but somehow hadn't the heart to do it, Poppy. But now she must be told. When shall I write it, mother? Here's a penny, child. Go and get a sheet and an envelope from the shop at the end of the street, and if the babies will only keep asleep, we'll write it at once. The paper was bought, and Poppy seated herself on a high stool, and wrote as her mother told her. My dear grandmother, this comes hoping to find you quite well, as it leaves my mother very ill, and the doctor says she'll never be no better, and my father went away last year, and nobody knows what has become of him, and he never writes, nor sends no money, nor nothing, and mother has got two little babies, and they are both boys, and she wants me to ask you to pray God to take care of us, and will you please write us a letter? Your affectionate granddaughter, Poppy. It was well that the letter was finished, then, for that very night Poppy's mother was taken very much worse, and the next morning she was not able to rise from her bed. And now began a very hard time for the little girl. Two babies to look after, and a sick mother to nurse, was almost more than it was possible for one small pair of arms to manage. The neighbors were very kind and came backwards and forwards, bringing Poppy's mother tempting things to eat, and carrying off dirty clothes to wash at home, or any little piece of work which Poppy could not manage. And often, very often, one or another of them would come and sit by the sick woman, or would carry off the crying babies to their own homes, that she might have a little rest and quiet. But in spite of all this kind help, it was a very hard time for Poppy. The neighbors had their own homes and their own families to attend to, and could only give their spare time to the care of their sick neighbor. And an eye Poppy had a weary time of it. Her mother was weak and restless and full of fever and of pain, and she tossed about on her pillow hour after hour, watching her good little daughter with tears in her eyes as she walked up and down with the babies, trying to soothe them to sleep. Sometimes she would try to sit up in bed and hold little Enoch or Elijah for a few moments, but she had become so terribly weak that the effort was too much for her, and after a few minutes she would fall back fainting on her pillow, and Poppy had to take the baby away and bathe her mother's forehead with water before she could speak to her again. So it was a weary and anxious time for the child. The neighbor said she was growing an old grandmother, so careworn and anxious had she become, and Poppy herself could hardly believe that she was the same little girl who had gazed in the toy shop window only a few months ago and had longed for one of those beautiful wax dolls. She felt too old and tired ever to care again. End of chapter 6《Chapter Seven of Poppy's Presence by Mrs. O. F. Walton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Esther Ben Simonides. Chapter Seven A Visit for Grandmother. The summer began very early that year, and it was the hottest summer that Poppy had ever known. Even at the end of May and the beginning of June, the heat was so great that it made people ill and tired and cross. Poppy's mother, who was never able to leave her bed, felt it very much. The court was close and stifling, and the old window in the small bedroom would only open a little way at the bottom, so that very little air could get into the room, and the poor woman lay hour after hour, panting for breath and almost fainting with the heat. It was no easy time for Poppy. The neighbors were still very kind, but the heat made them unable to do as much as before, and somehow everybody's temper went wrong with hot weather, and there was a good deal of quarreling in the court. Mrs. Brown quarreled with Mrs. Jones about something, and Ann Turner would not speak to Mrs. Smith because she had offended her about something else and once or twice there was angry voices in the court, which troubled the poor sick woman. And when neighbors came to see her, they would pour out the history of the grievances, and this word and distressed her a good deal. The babies, too, felt the hot weather very much. They were seven months old now, but they were poor, sickly little creatures, quite unable to roll about the floor like other babies of that age, and needing almost as much nursing and care as they had done when they were first born. Poppy did her very best for them and for her mother, but she was only a child after all, and she could not keep them clean as they ought to have been kept. Now the house is tidy and free from dirt as it used to be when her mother was able to look after it, and sometimes poor Poppy, brave though she was, felt almost inclined to give up in despair. There was one day when she was very much cast down and troubled. It was, if possible, a hotter day than the ten very hot days which had gone before it, and it was everybody's washing day. The court was filled with clothes, steaming in the hot sun and shutting out what little air might possibly have crept down to the rooms below, but there seemed to be no air anywhere that sultry day. Poppy's mother was very much worn and exhausted, and Enoch and Eli did nothing but cry. Hour after hour they cried, not a loud, angry scream such as strong babies might give, but a weak, weary wail which went on and on and on, till Poppy felt as if she could bear it no longer. She left them on the bed for a few minutes beside her mother, and ran downstairs to make a cup of tea and a piece of toast for her mother's dinner. They lived on bread and tea now, for they had nothing but what they got from the parish, and if the neighbors had not been very kind and brought them in little things from time to time, even the parish money would not have been enough to keep them from starving. When Poppy went downstairs, she had a little cry. There was so much to do, and somehow that hot day it seemed impossible to do it. She knew that the house was untidy, and the babies need washing, and there were dirty clothes waiting to be made clean, and cups and plates and basins standing ready to be washed up, and it seemed too hot and tiring to do anything. 
Poppy went to the window for a minute, and putting her fingers in her ears that she might not hear the wail of the babies, she stood looking up at the strip of blue sky which she could see just between the houses of the court. How pure and lovely it looked. And God lived somewhere up there, Poppy knew. And God loved her. Poppy knew that, too. Her mother said he had sent his dear son to die for her, the only son he had. He had sent him to die on the cross, that she might go to live with him in heaven. God must love her very much to do that, Poppy said to herself. She thought she would ask God to help her that hot day. If he loved her, she was sure he would feel sorrow for her, now that she was so tired and had so much to do. So looking up at the blue sky, Poppy said aloud, Oh, God, please help me, for I am very tired, and I don't know how ever to get everything done. And please make me a good girl, for Jesus Christ's sake. Amen. Would God hear her prayer? Poppy asked herself as she came away from the window. She wondered very much if he would. And if he did hear her, how would the help come? It was not likely that he would send one of the neighbors in to help her, for they were all too busy with their washing to have much time to spare. There were the angels. They were God's servants, and Poppy learned at school that they came to help God's people. But she had never heard of an angel washing up cups and saucers, or cleaning a house, or nursing a baby, and that was the help Poppy wanted just then. Well, she had prayed to God, and Mother said God always heard prayer. She would wait and see. Poppy filled the kettle and was trying to put a few things in order in the untidy kitchen where there came a knock at the door. Poppy started. Could someone be coming to help her? The neighbors never knocked. They opened the door and walked in. And Poppy thought the angels would not knock, for her teacher told her they could come in when the door was shut. Who could it be? She went to the door and opened it, and there she found an old woman with a large market basket on her arm. She wanted to know if Mrs. Fenwick lived there. Yes, that was her mother's name, Poppy said. Whereupon the old woman came in, put down her basket, and then seized Poppy and gave her a good hearty kiss on both her cheeks. "'Why, you're John Henry's barn,' she said, "'and as like him as two pins is like each other.' "'It was grandmother, dear old grandmother, "'who had come from her home far away in the country "'to see her son's wife and children "'and to do all she could to help them. "'And grandmother had not been long in the house "'before Poppy felt sure that God had sent her "'and that she was just the help the poor child so much needed. "'Poor old grandmother, she was hot and tired and dusty, "'and she had been travelling in the heat "'for many hours on that hot summer's morning. "'She sat down on a chair by the door, "'fanning herself with a red cotton pocket handkerchief, and kissing Poppy again and again as she called her my lad's bonny barn, and told her that she was the very picture of what her father was when he was her age, and how her John Henry was the best scholar in all Thoroughswalden school, and she felt sure his barn must be a clever little girl too. End of chapter 7— Now, my dear, said Grandmother, when she had rested for a minute or two, where's my lad's wife? Your mother, my lass, where is she? — Oh, she's in bed, Grandmother, said Poppy. She's very ill as my mother. — I'll go up and see her, said the old woman, to think that my John Henry has been a married man these ten years, and I've never seen his wife. But when she did see John Henry's wife, Grandmother sat down and sobbed like a child. She was so white, so thin, so worn, that the kind old woman's heart was filled with love and shame, love for her poor suffering daughter-in-law, shame that her son— the lad of whom she had been so proud should have left her when she needed him so much. How long grandmother would have cried it is impossible to say, had not a dismal wail come from one side of the bed, followed almost immediately by another dismal wail from the other side of the bed. It was Enoch and Elijah, who had fallen asleep for a few minutes whilst Poppy was downstairs, but who had waked up at the sound of a strange voice. Grandmother sprang from her seat as soon as she heard them cry. She had not seen the babies before, for they were covered by the bedclothes. She held them one in each arm and kissed them again and again. "'Oh, my bonny, bonny bairns,' she said, "'my own little darling lambs, "'to think that God has sent you back again. "'Why, I'm like Job, my lass. "'I lost them five and forty years ago. "'Aye, but it seems only five and forty days. "'Oh, my own beautiful little lads, "'I kicked sore against losing them. "'I did indeed, my lass, "'poor silly fool that I was. "'And now here God's given them back again. "'I'm a regular old Job, ain't I? "'Not that I was patient like him. "'He is a sight better than me, a sight better. "'Oh, you dear things, won't your grandmother love you? "'Had you twins of your own grandmother?' asked her daughter-in-law. "'I am my dear that I had, and little lads, too. The finest children you ever saw. Why, it was the talk of the countryside, my dear, what beautiful bairns they was.' "'And how old were they when you lost them, grandmother?' "'Why, my dear,' said the old woman, "'my child was ten months and one week old, and his child was ten months and three weeks old. Just a fortnight's difference, my dear.' "'I thought you said they were both yours, grandmother,' said Poppy. "'I, my darling, said they was, but that was how we got to talk of them. You see, me and my master had been married nigh on five years, and never had no children. We lived up at the farm at that time.' And then these babies came, and I think our heads were fairly turned by them. He was well nigh crazed, he was indeed, my dear. Sally, he says when he came in to look at them, you pick one and I'll have the other. Half and half, that's a fair share, he says. Now, Sally, you choose first. Well, says I, I'll have the ginger-haired one. It's most like me. I used to have ginger hair, my dear. You wouldn't believe it, for it's all turned white now. But I had, just like Poppy there, beautiful ginger hair. 
Some folks don't like the colour, my dear, but your grandfather used to like it. Why, he said when he was courting me that my hair was the colour of marigolds, and they was always his favourite flowers. He had em in his own little garden when he was a tiny lad, he said. Well, I picked the one with ginger hair, and called it my child, and he picked the black-haired one, which is the very picture of him. Why, he had a head like a crow's back, my dear. And so we each had a baby of our own, and would you believe it, my lass? You took that care of it. You'd have thought he was an old nurse. You would indeed. He washed it and he dressed it. Aye, but I did laugh the first time. And he gave it the bottle, and he got a little girl from the village to come and mind it when he was out. And in the evening we sat one on each side of the fire, he with his child and I with mine. And then at night, when we went to bed, his bairn slept in his arms and my bairn slept in mine. Well, then we had them christened, and his was Jackie and mine was Jemmy. And he was proud of his child that day, as proud as Punch. He was indeed, my dear. He carried him all the way. Oh, dear, oh, dear, what have I done? said the old woman, as she turned to the bed and saw Poppy's mother in tears. Why, you're crying, my dear, I oughtn't to have told you. What a silly old goose I am. I ought to have remembered that lad of mine and how he's gone off and left you, instead of giving a hand with his own babies as my master did. Dear me, dear me, whatever was I thinking of? Oh, Granny, said her daughter-in-law, do tell me about them. I like to hear. I do indeed. Please go on. Well, my dear, if you will have it so, I'll go on. They grew up beautiful babies, they did indeed, and didn't folks admire them? There's lots of people drives through our village when it's the season at Scarborough. They takes carriages, my dear, and they come driving out with lads in red jackets, riding on them poor tired horses. Post Williams, I think they call them. I'm telling you no lie, my dear, when I tell you them the little lads has brought in scores of three-penny bits that the ladies have thrown from their carriages. When the girl took them out by the lodge gate, they was so taken with the pretty dears they was. Well, all went on well, my dear, last, till the teeth began to come. Oh, them teeth, what a nuisance they are. I lost mine, my dear, all but two, and I'm sure it's a good job to have done with them. They're nothing but bother, always aching and breaking and worrying you. Well, the teething went very hard with the babies. His child was the worst, though, and one day little Jackie had a convulsion fit. And didn't my master send off for the doctor in a hurry? And all that night he sat up watching his bairn, for fear he should have another fit. Doctor came once or twice after that, for the little lad kept poorly, though the fits did not come back. Aye, doctor, I says one day, when he had little Jack in his arms, and was saying what a pretty boy he was. Aye, doctor, I says, but look at my child. And I held up little Jemmy. He's the beauty now, isn't he, doctor? You're very fond of him, aren't you? Says doctor. Fond of him? Why, doctor, I says, I love him till I often think I could go barefoot all my life, and live on bread and water if it would do him a bit of good. Take care you don't love him too much, said the doctor, looking quite grave. Folks mustn't make idols, even of their own bairns. Don't be offended, missus, he says, but it doesn't do to set your heart too much on anything, not even on your own little lad. You might lose him, you know. Well, I was happy with the doctor after that. I was a bit put out, and I says, well, doctor, if I thought I was going to lose him, I would love him a hundred times better than ever. So, my dear, doctor shook his head at me and went away, and, would you believe it, only five hours after I had to send for him all in a hurry to come to my child. He'd taken a fit like Jack had. But, oh, my dear, he didn't come out of it as Jackie did. It was a sore, sore fit. Before doctor could get to him, and he ran all the way from the village, my bonny bairn was gone. Oh, grandmother, you would feel that, said Poppy's mother. Yes, my dear, I did indeed. And when bedtime came, and he had his child laid aside him, and my child was laid dead in the best room downstairs, I felt as if my heart would break. He wanted me to take his child, but little Jackie was used to father and wouldn't come to me, and, my dear, I cried myself to sleep. How much longer did the other baby live, grandmother? said Poppy. Only fifteen days, my dear, and we buried em both in one little grave. I often go to look at it now when we put his child in, and I saw my child's little coffin at the bottom of the grave, my dear. I wish I could go in, too. I was very hard and rebellious. I was. I see it all now, said grandmother, wiping her eyes. But just to think of God giving him back to me after five and forty years. Why, it's wonderful. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and forget not all his benefits. That's the verse for me, my dear, now, isn't it? And grandmother took up first Enoch and then Elijah, and kissed them and hugged them as lovingly as ever she had kissed her own little babies. End of chapter 8 Chapter 9 of Poppy's Presents by Mrs. O. F. Walton This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Esther ben Simonides. Chapter 9 John Henry's Burn I have read the story of a fairy who came down into a dark and dismal room, where a poor girl clad in rags was cleaning the fireside, and who by one touch of her wand had changed everything in the room. The girl found herself dressed in a beautiful robe, and everything around her was made lovely and pleasant to look at it. It was a new place altogether. Now, I think that grandmother was something like that good fairy, for it was perfectly wonderful what a change she made in the course of a few hours in that dismal house. No sooner had she had a cup of tea than she took off her bonnet and shawl and set to work to put things in order. First she gave the babies a warm bath, and cried over them, and loved them to her heart's content. And then, as they had no clean clothes to put on, she wrapped them in some of her own garments which she took from her bundle, and, soothed by the unusual comfort and cleanliness, Enoch and Elijah were soon fast asleep. Then Grandmother trotted downstairs again for more hot water, and washed Poppy's poor sick mother, and brushed her tangled hair, and then dressed her in one of her own clean nightgowns, 
smelling of the sweet field of clover in which it had been dried, and put on the bed a pair of her own sheets, which she had brought with her in case they might be useful. Oh, how grateful Poppy's mother was! Granny, she said as she gave her a kiss, I haven't been so comfortable never since I was ill. I declare I feel quite sleepy. Well, go to sleep, my lass, said Grandmother. That's the very best thing you can do. So she laid the babies beside their mother in bed, and she and Poppy went downstairs. Now, my little lass, said the old woman, you and me will soon tidy things up here. It was wonderful to Poppy to see how quickly her grandmother could work. She was a brisk, active old woman, and in a very short time, all the cups and saucers and plates were washed and put by, the fireside was set, and the kitchen table was scoured. Then, leaving Poppy to wash the floor, her grandmother carried off a heap of dirty clothes lying in the corner into the tiny back kitchen, and long before Poppy's mother or the babies woke, there were two lines of little garments hung out to be quickly dried in the scorching afternoon sun. "'And now, Poppy,' said grandmother, "'fetch my basket, my good little lass, and we'll unpack it.' Oh, what a basket that was! Poppy's eyes opened wide with astonishment when she saw all that it contained. There was a whole pound of fresh country butter, a loaf of grandmother's own homemade bread, a plum cake she had made on purpose for Poppy, a jar of honey made by grandmother's bees, and a box of fresh eggs laid by grandmother's hens, a bottle of thick yellow cream, and, what Poppy liked best of all, a bunch of roses and southern wooden pansies, and lavender from grandmother's garden. It was very pleasant to get tea ready when there were so many good things to put on the table and it was still more pleasant when Poppy's mother woke to take her a cup of tea with the good country cream in it, and to watch how she enjoyed some thin slices of grandmother's bread and butter, and a fresh egg led that morning by little Jenny, the bonniest hen of the lot. Now, Poppy, said grandmother, when tea was over, you get on your hat and go out a bit. You're a good little lass if there ever was one. Bless you, my darling, my own John Henry's barn. But you want a bit of rest and play, you do indeed. Yes, that she does, said her mother. Why, it's weeks since she got out for a walk. Not since I was in bed, bless her. So Poppy put on her hat and went out. It was a lovely summer's evening. The great heat of the day was over, and a gentle breeze was blowing, which was very cooling and refreshing to the child little girl. She went slowly past the great cathedral, and she thought how beautiful it looked, standing out against the quiet evening sky. Then she climbed up a flight of stone steep, and these took her to the top of the old wall, which went all round that ancient city. And now Poppy had a beautiful view, over the tops of the chimneys and across the black smoky courts, to where the green fields were lying in the evening sunshine, and the river was lighted up by the rays of the setting sun and there on top of the old city wall in a quiet little corner where no one could see her. Poppy knelt down and thanked God for hearing her prayer and for sending Grandmother to help her. On the way home she met Jack coming to meet her. Poppy, he said, I've got a present for you. He put his hand under his thick fustian jacket and pulled out something tied up tightly in a red cotton pocket handkerchief. Come and sit on this doorway, Poppy, he said, and look what it is. It was a large green apple. "'Why, Jack,' said Poppy, "'where did you get it? "'It's a funny time of year to get an apple. "'I didn't know there was anything left.' "'No, it's a real curiosity,' said Jack, "'and I said to myself when I got it, "'Poppy shall have that big un. "'She was such a plucky girl that night in the tower. "'She never whimpered nor nothing. "'So I tied him up in that handkerchief, and there he is.' "'Thank you so much, dear Jack,' said Poppy gratefully, "'but however did you get it?' "'Why, it was old Sellers, the greengrocer, gave him to me,' said Jack. "'Him as has a shop in Newcastle Street. "'He called me in, and he says, "'Do you want a job, my lad?' And when I told him, yes, I do, he sent me to clean out his apple room, where he stored his apples in winter. So he took me in, and it was a sight. Such a sight as you never saw, Poppy. Scores of them all rotten and smelling. Ay, they were horrid, said Jack, making a face. All but half a dozen that were quite good. Well, I picked him out, Poppy, and took him to old cellars, and he gave me half of them. So I had one myself, and I gave one to Sally, and I kept the biggest of them all for you. It was good of you, Jack, said Poppy. Well, eat it, then, said the boy. They're very nice, as good as can be and he smacked his lips at the recollection. But Poppy had rolled her apple up in her pinafore, and did not seem inclined to begin to eat it. "'Whatever are you keeping it for?' said Jack, in rather a disappointed voice. "'Jack,' said Poppy, stopping short, and looking up in his face, "'is it for my very own?' "'Why, yes, Poppy, of course.' "'To do just whatever I like with it.' "'Why, yes, of course,' said Jack again. "'Then I shall give it to my grandmother,' said Poppy. "'She's come today, and she's ever so good to us, "'and God sent her, and she's cleaned the house beautiful.' "'I shall give it to my grandmother, Jack.' "'All right,' he said. "'Only I'd like you to have just one bite yourself, Poppy, "'to see how good it is.' "'He was quite satisfied when Poppy promised to ask her grandmother "'to give her the last bite, and the little girl hastened home, "'feeling very happy, and picturing out to herself "'what a great treat the big apple would be to the old woman. "'Here,' she said, holding out to her, "'it's all for you, grandmother. "'Only Jack wants me just to have the last bite.' "'All for me,' repeated the old woman, "'as she looked up from the work she had in her hand, "'a little old torn frock of Poppy's which she was mending. "'Yes,' said the child. "'All for you.' "'Well, it's a beauty, I'm sure,' said Grandmother, turning it over in her hand. "'But you see, my dear, many's a long day since I've eaten an apple. "'Why, my little lass, what can an old body with only two teeth do?' "'Do try, Granny,' said Poppy, holding the apple to her mouth. 
It isn't so very hard, and Jack says it's so good. Do try. End of chapter 9《Chapter Ten of Poppy's Presents by Mrs. O. F. Walton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Esther Ben Simonides. Chapter Ten: The Mother's Legacy. And Grandmother did try, for she did not want to disappoint Poppy. But some of the two teeth would not go into the apple. They were too far apart, and there were no teeth below to help them. And so, after many attempts, the poor old woman was obliged to say, as she was afraid she could not manage it. If at first you don't succeed, try, try again. That's a good rule, my dear, but it doesn't always answer, Poppy. But I'll tell you what, my little girl," said she, as she noticed how disappointed the child was. "I'll put it in the oven and bake it for my supper, and then I shall have a treat." "Oh, Granny, I'm so glad," said Poppy, throwing her arms round her neck. "I do love you so very much. You are so good to me." "Why, you're John Henry's bairn," said Granny, as she held her fast in her arms. "How could I help loving John Henry's bairn?" "Polly, my dear," said Grandmother the next day to Poppy's mother. "Polly, my dear, I'm going to take you home with me." But the sick woman shook her head. "Don't shake your head, my dear," said Grandmother. "I believe if I could put you down on the top of the moors, and if you could get the breezes off the heather, why, my lass, I believe you'd get well in no time." "You must ask the doctor, Grandmother," said Poppy's mother. "He is coming today." So when the doctor had paid his usual visit, Grandmother trotted after him downstairs. "Now, doctor," said she, "I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to take her home with me. Country is the best physic after all, now isn't it, doctor? You can't say anything against that. I'll be bound." But the doctor shook his head. Dear me, doctor," said grandmother. "Don't you go and shake your head. Surely she'll be well enough to go in a week or ten days, or maybe a fortnight or three weeks, doctor," she added, as she saw that he looked very grave. "My good woman," said the doctor, "you don't know how well she is. It is only a question of time now." "You don't mean to say, doctor," said grandmother, "that she won't get better?" "She may live a week," said the doctor, as he put on his hat, "but I do not think she will live so long." Poor old grandmother! It was a great downfall to her hopes. She had thought and hoped and believed that the country air would soon make John Henry's wife well again. And now she was told that she had only a few days to live. She could not go upstairs with such news as that, so she bustled about the kitchen, pretending to be busy washing up the tea things and sweeping the fireside, and stopping every now and then to wipe away the tears that would come in her eyes. And all this time, Poppy's mother was waiting and listening and wondering why Grandmother did not come to tell her what the doctor had said. At last, she could wait no longer, but rapped on the floor with the stick which Grandmother had put by her bedside. Slowly, very slowly, the old woman went upstairs. But even when she was in the bedroom, she did not seem inclined to talk, but began to wash Enoch and Elijah, and never turned her face towards her daughter-in-law, lest she should see how tearful her eyes were. Grandmother said, "Poppy's mother at last, tell me what the doctor said." "He won't let me take you away, my lass," said Grandmother shortly. "Does he think I shall not live long?" asked the sick woman. "Tell me what he said, Grandmother, please." "He said you might perhaps live a week, my dear," said Grandmother, bursting into tears and rocking Enoch and Elijah in her arms. Poppy's mother did not speak, but she did just what King Hezekiah did when he got a similar message. She turned her face to the wall. Grandmother did not dare to look at her for some time, and when she did, she saw that her pillow was wet with tears. "Poor, poor lass," she said tenderly. "No wonder you cannot help fretting. It's a fearsome thing to die. It is indeed." "Oh, it isn't that, Grandmother," said Poppy's mother. "It isn't that. I was thinking about the poor children." "And what about the children? Bless 'em," said the old woman. "Why, I'm afraid it will go hardly with them in the house," said the poor woman, beginning to cry afresh. The do say some of them old nurses are not over good to babies, and they think them such a lot of trouble, poor little motherless dears. And there's Poppy too; she's been ever such a good little girl to me, and she'll feel so lonesome like in that big rambling place. I don't suppose I'll let her be with the babies, for all she loves them so. Now, Polly, my dear," said Grandmother, starting from her seat. "Never you say another word about that. If you think I'm going to let John Henry's bairns go into the workhouse, why, my dear, you don't know what sort of stuff John Henry's mother is made of. Why, my lass, it would be throwing God Almighty's gifts back in His face." I've wearied for my twin babies all these years, and fretted and fumed because I'd lost them. And then, as soon as he gives them back to me, I go and shove 'em off into the house. No, no, my dear," said grandmother. "I'm not such an old stupid as that. And as for Poppy, my lass, why she'll be my right hand woman. They shall come home with me, my dear, and I'll be their mother. Dear blessed little chaps, and Poppy shall be their nurse, and we'll all be as happy as ever we can be without you, my dear. Oh, grandmother, it seems too good to be true," said Poppy's mother. "But you can never keep three children." Yes, my dear, I can. My good man, he was careful and thrifty, and he saved a good tidy sum. And my lady's very good to me. Why, I live in the lodge rent free, and get my coals and many's the coppers the folks in their carriages throws out when I go to open the gate. You see, it's sort of a public road, my dear, and there's all kinds of folk goes by. So I've enough and to spare. Only I'm lonesome often and haven't nobody to speak to for hours together. 
and now the lord's going to send me good company and i shall be a happier woman than i've been since my good man died and my john henry went away i shall indeed my dear poppy's mother was almost too happy to answer her a great load was lifted off her heart and she lay quite still with her eyes closed for some time trying to tell her best friend how grateful she was to him for all he had done for her meanwhile the poor old woman was rocking the babies in her arms and wiping away the tears which would come in her eyes as she thought of what the doctor had said then poppy came in bright and happy with a bunch of white roses in her hands which jack friends the greengrocer had given him and which he had sent to poppy's mother she was very much distressed to see her grandmother crying what is it granny dear she said putting her arms on her neck and kissing her are you poorly you had best tell her grandmother said poppy's mother it will come less sudden like on her after but grandmother could not speak she tried once or twice but something in her throat seemed to choke her and at length she laid the sleeping babies on the bed buried her face in her apron and went downstairs what is it mother said poppy did the doctor say you were worse poppy said her mother shall i tell you what the doctor said my darling yes please mother said the child he said that in a few days more i should be quite well poppy well and strong like you my dear no more pain no more weakness forever then why does granny cry said poppy with a puzzled face because darling grandmother wanted me to go to her home and get well there but instead of that god has to take me to his home poppy to be well for ever and ever will you try to be glad for me darling yes mother said poppy with a little sob i'll try but oh mother i wish you'd take me too End of chapter 10 Chapter 11 of Poppy's Presence by Mrs. O. F. Walton This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Esther ben Simonides Chapter 11 The Story of the Ring Polly, my dear, said Grandmother, when she was sitting beside her the next day, aren't you feared to die? No, Grandmother, said the poor woman. I'm not afraid. Well, i should be said grandmother if i knew i was going away in a few days why my dear i should be frightened out of my wits i should indeed and so should i have been two years ago said moppy's mother but i'm not afraid now i'll tell you how it was granny that i got not to be frightened to die i used to go to a mother's meeting of a monday afternoon before john henry went away and before i had to go out washing and while we did our sewing a lady used to read to us who was it my dear miss lloyd she's the clergyman's sister granny well, one day I remember it so well. She brought a beautiful ring to show us. Oh, it was a beauty, Grandmother. There was a ring of lovely large diamonds all round it. She told us that some old lady had given it to her for a keepsake, just before she died, and that she would not lose it for a great deal. Now, she said, you were all my friends, and I want a bit of advice. I'm going to start tomorrow on a long journey. I'm going to travel in foreign parts and stop at all sorts of inns and lodging places. Now, do you think it would be safe for me to take my ring with me? Well, ma'am, said old Betty, who's always ready with her tongue. I wouldn't advise you to do so. They're queer folks and foreigners, and maybe you'd be washing your hands at some of them outlandish places, and take off your ring, and then go away and leave it behind, and never see it no more. That's just what I've been thinking, said Miss Lloyd. Thank you for your advice, Betty. I'm sure my ring will not be safe, and I can't keep it safe myself. Well, then what shall I do? Couldn't you trust it to somebody to take care of for you, ma'am? said another woman. Thank you. That's a very good idea. I think it's the best thing I can do. Now let me think, said Miss Lloyd. I must get someone who is able to take care of it, and who is willing, too. Oh, I know, she said. There's my brother. He is able. He has a strong box at the bank, where he keeps my papers. He can put it in there, and I feel sure he will be willing to do it for me. I hear his voice in the next room. I'll call him in and ask him. And did she ask him? said Grandmother. Yes, she brought him in, and she said, Now, Arthur, she said, these friends of mine advised me to trust my ring to you. I can't keep it my safe myself, but I feel I can trust you. I know you are able to keep it from me whilst I am away. I commit it to your care. So up she got from her seat and handed the ring in its little case to Mr. Lloyd, and he put it in its waistcoat pocket, saying as he left the room, All right, Emily, don't you trouble about it. I'll take care of it. Well, my dear, said Grandmother, all that was very nice, I've no doubt, but how it makes you happier to die, it beats me to see. Oh, but you haven't heard the end of it, Grandmother, said Poppy's mother. No, nor I won't hear it till you've had a cup of tea, my dear. You're as white as a sheet. I oughtn't to have left you talk so long. But when she had the tea and an hour's quiet sleep, and when the babies were asleep and Grandmother and Poppy were sitting beside her in the twilight, the poor woman went on with her story. When Mr. Lloyd had gone, Grandmother, his sister said, I can't thank you all enough for your good advice. I feel quite happy about my ring. And now you won't mind my asking you what you are going to do with your treasure. Well, ma'am, said old Betty, the only ring that I have is my wedding ring, and that's not worth sixpence to anybody but myself, so I don't suppose it stands much chance of being stolen. Betty, said Miss Lloyd, turning to her, 
you have a treasure worth far far more than my ring i mean your precious soul which will live for ever and ever and ever somewhere your undying self betty only your body will go in the grave you yourself will be living for ever dear friend she said speaking to all of us i want each of you to ask this question what about my soul is it safe then he told us grandmother that we were travelling through an enemy's country satan and his evil spirits wanted to get our treasure she told us we could not keep our souls safe ourselves if we tried we should certainly lose it as she would have lost her ring and oh dear friends she said what shall it profit you if you gain the whole world and lose your own soul well she was right there my dear said grandmother now then she says i want you to do as you advise me to do i want you to get someone to keep your treasure for you someone who is able someone who is willing who shall it be i suppose you mean the lord ma'am said old betty yes she said i mean the lord jesus he is able for he has all power he is willing for he died on purpose that he might do so won't you trust your treasure to him she said won't you go straight to him and say lord jesus here is my soul i can't keep it myself satan wants to get it for his own i trust it to thee i commit it to thee to be safe well grandmother said poppy's mother i didn't forget what she said and then i went on henry had gone upstairs to bed i knelt down in the kitchen and trusted my soul to the lord jesus to be saved because he had died for me i put my soul in his hands grandmother and i know he will keep it safe well my dear said grandmother it's to be hoped he will i know he will grandmother i don't doubt him said poppy's mother miss lloyd taught us a verse about that i know whom i have believed and i am persuaded that he is able to keep that which i have committed unto him against that day and she said if we were begin doubting that our soul was safe when we had taken it to jesus to be saved it would be the same as saying we did not trust him what would you think she said if i were to be saying all the time i was away oh dear me i am afraid i shall never see my ring again i am afraid it isn't safe after all why ma'am said old betty you'll excuse me saying so but i should think he was very rude to mr lloyd and if i was there i should give you a bit of my mind you mustn't be offended at me saying so says betty but i should indeed and what would you say betty said mrs lloyd i should tell you ma'am says betty that if you had trusted your ring to mr lloyd it was as safe as safe could be and it was an insult to him to doubt it betty says mrs lloyd you're quite right and that's just what i feel about the lord jesus i know whom i have believed and i'm persuaded that he is able to keep that soul which i have committed unto him well said grandmother it seems all right when you put it like that and i wish i was as happy as you are my dear but i'm a good-for-nothing old woman i am indeed and somehow i'm afraid he wouldn't do it for me poppy said her mother do you think you could find me a mission hymn book yes mother said poppy here's one on the table the poor woman turned off the leaves with trembling fingers for she was very weak and tired poppy dear she said when she had found the place read this hymn to grandmother and poppy read jesus i will trust thee trust thee with my soul guilty lost and helpless thou canst make me whole there is none in heaven or on earth like thee thou hast died for sinners therefore lord for me jesus i do trust thee trust without a doubt whosoever cometh thou wilt not cast out faithful is thy promise precious is thy blood thee is my soul's salvation thou my saviour god o oh, grandmother and o oh, poppy she said when the child had finished reading trust your soul to jesus to-night well my dear i will said poor old grandmother wiping her eyes and you my own little poppy yes dear mother said the child i won't forget end of chapter eleven Chapter Twelve of Poppy's Presents by Mrs. O. F. Walton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Esther Ben Simonides. Chapter Twelve, The Wonderful Fire. Polly, my dear," said Grandmother the next day as she was washing the babies. "I didn't forget what you asked me to do last night, but I'm afraid, my dear. I'm very much afraid." "What are you afraid of, Granny?" asked Poppy's mother. "Why, well, I'm afraid of getting cold and hard again, my dear," she said it's all very well for poppy but i've been putting off so long i'm afraid of slipping into all the old bad ways again why my dear i've tried to pray and to read my bible scores of times before but my mind has soon gone a wandering away to my chickens or to my butter or to the bit of washing i do for the hall and all such like things now my dear how do i know it won't be like that again he can't get cold and hard granny if the fire burns bright and the lord will keep it alight he will indeed what do you mean by the fire my dear why granny i saw it at the mother's meeting miss lloyd showed us it such a pretty picture i have often thought of it since tell me about it my lass if it won't bring the cough on no i feel so much easier to-day granny it doesn't hurt me to talk like it did last week i'll stop if it tires me well there was a fire in the picture burning on the hearth a bright cheerful little fire like i used to make of an evening when john henry came home and in front of the fire granny was a man throwing buckets full of water on to put it out 
but the fire was blazing away, and did not seem a bit worse for it. "'That was a queer thing, my dear,' said Granny. "'Yes, but Miss Lloyd showed us that, behind the fire on the other side of the wall, another was standing, and this one was quietly pouring oil into the fire to keep it burning. And it never had a chance of going out, Granny, for the oil did it a deal more good than the water did it harm.' "'Well, my dear,' said Grandmother, "'of course it would be so. Oil makes a deal of blaze when it falls on fire, but what has that got to do with me and my poor old heart?' But Polly had a bad fit of coughing, and the good old woman would not let her answer her question till she had two hours' quiet rest. Then she seemed brighter again and was able to go on. Miss Lloyd explained it beautiful, Granny. She told us the fire was the work of grace in our hearts. As soon as we trusted our souls to Jesus to be saved, she said the fire was lighted, the good work was begun. But then she said, Don't forget you've got an enemy, Satan. We'll try to put the fire out. He'll send somebody to laugh at you or to plague you about turning religious. That's one bucket of water. I'll send you a lot of work to do, to try and make you think you've no time to think about your soul. That's another bucket of water. He'll have all sorts of pleasures and cares and difficulties ready. All of them buckets of water, Granny. Ay, my dear, I see that, and I'll be bound there's a bucket not far off coming on my poor little fire. But what about the oil, my dear? I'm coming to the oil, Granny. Satan has his buckets of water, but the dear Lord has his bottle of oil. It's the Holy Spirit, Granny, who alone can make us good or keep us good. And if the Lord puts his Holy Spirit in our hearts, it is of no use Satan trying to put the fire out. He'll have to give it up for a bad job. Reach me the Testament, Granny. There's a verse I'll read to you. She turned over the leaves for some time, and at last she found the words she wanted, and she put a mark against them, that Granny might find them for herself when she had gone away. The words were these, He which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Polly, my dear, said Granny after a pause, do you think he'll do that for me? Do what, Granny? Do you think he will give me his Holy Spirit? And then Polly's mother gave grandmother another text, but this time she did not find it, for she knew it by heart. If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? Grandmother sat by the side of the bed long after Enoch and Elijah had fallen asleep. She seemed to have no heart to bustle about that morning. She wanted to feel sure that her soul was safe. And when she thought that Poppy's mother was fast asleep with her babies lying beside her, Granny knelt down and said aloud, O oh Lord, I am a poor sinful old woman, but I want thee to save me. O oh Lord Jesus, thou hast died for me. I trust my soul to thee. Here it is, I put it into thy hands. O oh, give me thy Holy Spirit. Keep the fire bright in my soul, please, Lord Jesus. Do. Amen. But Poppy's mother was not asleep. She was only lying with her eyes closed. And as the old woman got up from her knees, she smiled and said softly, The soul that Jesus has fled for repose, he will not, he will not desert to his foes. That soul, though all hell should endeavor to shake, he'll never, no, never, no, never forsake. Amen, said Granny. Amen. End of chapter 12 Chapter 13 of Poppy's Presence by Mrs. O. F. Walton This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Esther Van Simonide Chapter 13 Poppy's Father Comes Home the doctor was not wrong. In less than a week, the Lord took Poppy's mother to his beautiful home, where there was no more sickness nor pain. And grandmother and Poppy and little Enoch and Elijah were left behind. But as the grandmother and the child stood beside the grave where her body was laid to rest, they knew that she was far away, safe in his keeping to whom he had trusted her soul. They knew that she was well and happy and full of joy, and they tried to be glad for her sake. Grandmother was anxious to get home, and as soon as all could be arranged, she set off with Poppy and the twins. The neighbors were very kind and did all they could to help them, and Jack rubbed away something with his sleeve, which was very like a tear, as he saw their train steam out of the station. It was a new life for Poppy. Grandmother lived in a lovely valley, full of beautiful trees and running brooks, and quiet, peaceful glades, where in the daytime the squirrels played and the birds sang, where in the dim evening hours the rabbits came to nibble the grass, and where at night, when Poppy and her little brothers were asleep, the solemn old owls sat in the trees and called to each other in harsh and ugly voices. Through the middle of the valley ran a white smooth road, winding in and out amongst the trees, and on this road came the carriages, driving quickly along, with postilions and scarlet coats riding on the horses in front, and the ladies and gentlemen, who had come to see this beautiful valley, leaning back in the carriages behind. It was Poppy's delight to open the gate for these carriages, and in this way she was able to save her grandmother a good deal of running about. She used to climb up the hillside and watch until they were in sight and then run down as fast as she could, that she might have the gate open in time for them to pass through. That was Poppy's work out of school hours, for her grandmother sent her regularly to the pretty little country school, and would let nothing keep her away from it. 
Dear old grandmother, how hard she worked for Poppy and for the babies. She thought nothing a trouble that she could do for them, and Poppy loved her more and more. As the months went by, little Enoch and Elijah grew fat and strong. The fresh country air and the new milk made a wonderful change in them. And when the next summer came, they were able to run about and could climb on the hillside with Poppy and gather the wild roses and the harebells and the honeysuckle and would sit on the bank near the cottage watching the carriages and trying to catch the pence which the people threw them as they drove by. One Saturday afternoon at the end of the summer, as Poppy was playing with them outside the lodge, she caught sight of a man coming quickly down the road. She ran to open the gate for him, but as she did so she gave a sudden cry of joy. It was her father, her long-lost father, come home again. "'Why, Poppy,' he said, my own dear little woman, "'what are you doing here? Come and kiss your poor father, Poppy. "'And who are these two bonny little lads?' he asked, as Enoch and Elijah came running up to him. "'They're our babies,' said Poppy. "'God sent them after you went away, father. They both came on one day.' "'Dear me, dear me, and a thing I never knew,' said her father. "'Poor Polly. And so you've all come to see Grandmother. I never thought I should find you here. I was going home to-morrow. I must run in and see Mother. Is she with Grandmother, Poppy?' see mother then he did not know and poppy could not tell him she followed him with a very grave and sorrowful face holding little enoch and elijah by the hand grandmother came to the door at the sound of his voice why if it isn't my john henry she cried yes mother it's your john henry ashamed of himself at last and so you've got poor polly and the barons here where is polly i wonder if she'll ever forgive me then you haven't been home yet john henry was all grandmother could say no mother i only got to liverpool this morning and i took you on my way i was going home to-morrow "'Where's Polly?' he said, pushing past her, and looking first into the parlour and then into the kitchen. "'Is she upstairs, mother? Polly! Polly! Polly!' "'John Henry,' said grandmother in a trembling voice, "'Polly has gone home.' "'Gone home and left the children behind her?' he exclaimed. "'Ay, my dear,' said his mother, bursting into tears. "'The Lord sent for her.' "'You don't mean to say she's dead, mother?' he moaned. "'Nay, my dear, she is living with the Lord,' said the old woman. "'Oh, mother, mother!' he sobbed. To think I left her like that, and she never knew how sorry I was. It was a long, long time before he could speak or tell them his story. He had been in America in dreadful straits and in many dangers. At length he fell ill with fever and lay for many weeks at the point of death in a log cabin, with only a boy of ten, the son of a poor immigrant, to do anything for him. But this trouble had shown him his sin, and he had come to the Lord Jesus for forgiveness, and ever since then God had blessed him. He had not become a rich man, but he had earned enough to bring him home, and he had saved a little besides and with this he hoped to start light afresh. "'But you'll never rob me of my bairns, John Henry,' said the little woman in alarm. "'I'll never take them away, when we've all been so happy together.' And the bare possibility of losing the children seemed to quite damp poor old grandmother's joy in getting her beloved John Henry home again. "'Well, mother, we must see,' he said. "'We must ask God to order for us.' And God did order most graciously, both for mother and son. The old woman told her trouble to my lady the next time that she drove through the lodge gates in her pony carriage, and she was very sympathizing and most anxious that the children should not have to leave their happy country home. She mentioned to the squire, and he very kindly offered Poppy's father a situation on his estate as gamekeeper. His life in America had made him far more fit for that kind of work than for carrying on his own trade, and he was most thankful not to have to take his children back to the city. So they all lived on together in the pretty lodge in the lovely valley, a happy little family, all loving the same lord and walking on the road to the same home. But Poppy never forgot her mother— and as Enoch and Elijah grew older, she would sit with them on the hillside and talk to them about her, and pointing to the blue sky, she would tell them that their mother was waiting for them there, and would be very much disappointed if they did not come. And often as they sat outside the lodge in the quiet summer evenings, they and their father would sing together, Mother's favorite hymn, and dear old grandmother would come to the door and join in a quavering voice in the beautiful words. Jesus, I will trust thee, trust thee with my soul. Guilty, lost, and helpless, thou canst make me whole. There is none in heaven or on earth like thee. Thou hast died for sinners, therefore, Lord, for me. End of chapter 13. Recording by Esther and Simonides. End of Poppy's Presence by Mrs. O. F. Walton.